why I'm right. Part three. All right. Let's go. How much longer do I have? I should have seen how long this is. Pretty long. Yeah, we probably have another 10 minutes at least. Plus me rambling. Shit. I didn't know I was... When I sit down and try to give myself breaks, I didn't know I was, Fuck. I might actually have another half hour. I haven't even gotten to the end yet. All right, got to the end. Yeah, this is long. This was like another 20,000 words. Well, no, it was 20,000 words, I think, the total thing. That's what I'm finding. I, that's about my pace, is I had the effort. That Citizen's Audit thing was about 20,000 words. Uh, my Complete American's Guide to the Revolution. I'm realizing that's how much my attention span was before I got on my effort, my next, my next adventure. And I'm trying to keep that in mind as I work on my current project. But really, my current project is just a book proposal. But... I'm doing this first because part of that is um, knowing who I am and reflecting. All of this stuff I think has value, and this is this is a kernel. This is like like my notes on the Iraq War. This is great. So I really, uh, yeah, I thought this was just an exercise, but there's some cool stuff in here. But in all compulsive societies, the common people must live to some extent, managed by the existing order, the genuinely popular culture of America is something that goes on above the surface, officially, and more or less condone, condoned by entrenched power. One thing one notices if one looks directly at the cultural leaders, especially the most successful, is that they are patriots, They're like, uh, what's her name, um, Ellen DeGeneres getting the Medal of Freedom. They are inveterate jingoists pander as much to their audience as their dignity will permit, are devoted to xenophobia, and possess possibly the shortest memories in the world. They have to justify state coercion in the face of skeptical, supposedly free people, Bill of Rights, Universal De Declaration of Human Rights, etc., etc., who are raised to believe that everybody has a right to participate in democracy. Also, the common people are without definite, meaningful organization and have been for so far for generations. The two-party system has taken hold of them. It was simply a bifurcation of the corporate class, and the nonconformist, nonconformist sects only influence minorities. And yet they have retained a deep tinge of Republican feeling while almost forgetting the meaning of representative democracy. The power worship, which that's how that came from that cop who told me about the difference between democracy and representative democracy is these ideas I can just recognize that the six months prior to this influenced all of these really well and if you don't write it out at that moment that you're feeling it you lose it or it just goes into your back of your brain and maybe hopefully becomes a part of your foundational beliefs but yeah I had some really good stuff that I just started thinking about the difference between direct democracy and representative democracy the power worship, which is the new religion of politics, and which has infected the American intelligentsia, has spread to the common people. Culture has been caught up with power politics. The realism which is preached in business and political camps reaches out to them. One can learn a good deal about the spirit of America from the comic-colored legitimacy that you see bestowed to state violence in the columns of the major papers. These packs are a sort of converging point upon which American critical thought has impaled itself. The old-fashioned journalists, their graded skepticism, their mixture of idealism and fact, and fact-finding, their extreme thoroughness, their deeply moral attitudes to life, are all immolated there. I'm not this good of a writer. This is Orwell, but it's my ideas. The inhumanity of the American state is perhaps its most marked characteristic. You notice it the instance you are born into the American system is a land where the economic indicators are numerical and the faces of poverty carry no weight. In no country inhabited by civilized man will you find more people shoved into incarceration. And with this goes something that is always written off by American apologists as the rugged pioneer or explorer, the American love of war and militarism. It is rooted deep in history. And it is strong in that upper 
in the, and is strong in the lower classes as well as the upper classes. Successive grotesque wars have shaken it, but not destroyed it. Well within living memory, a respectable Chicago museum thought it would be acceptable for America's future to take the gunner position in a helicopter diorama and for these children to imagine pacifying peasant villages in Vietnam. In ostensible times of peace, even when there are millions unemployed, it is difficult to redirect funds from the swollen public military to other non-militaristic public works, which would create real goods and therefore real growth and employ this underemployed and idle po population. The mass of impoverished persuaded by military employment or benefits are grateful, and their attitude towards the American war machine is invariably defensive. No reformist could rise to power by ignoring their employment or military tradition. No politician of peace has ever made any appeal to them. In the Iraq War, the justification which the administration manufactured and presented to Congress was not complicated but clear and documented deception. The only mean meaningful resistance they ever encountered was outside of the cultural mainstream. In America, all the, you know what they did? They fired Phil Donahue because they thought he was going to bring up too many questions about the oncoming war, and they didn't want him to be the face of, what was it, CBS, NBC, wherever he was. But that was a leaked memo. And Phil Donahue, that's where we were getting the, the, these long-form podcasts you get online. Well, you're getting in-depth discussions on TV at one point. We got rid of those people who asked too many questions as we become more and more homogenized and passive and... and and this has to do with also threats. The more shootings we have, it's, it's a cycle that feeds itself. The more shootings we have and the more violence we have, the more our acts are, our prisons are criminogenic. They create crime. The people we put away come out as better criminals. So why wouldn't our wars be, what would you call it, terroristogenic? They create terrorism. And that's, you just document terrorism since George Bush's wars of aggression have gone up worldwide. Gaddafi warned us, why would you attack me? I am holding back the immigration waves. And then Hillary Clinton, the person who said we came, we saw, he died, ha ha ha, we killed Gaddafi, and he was anal ra anally raped by his political opponents in the streets while we watched from the air. Our air support were the ones that bombed his caravan and allowed the, the whatever you call them, you could call them freedom fighters, but they were privatizing the oil field before they even won the war. So were they freedom fighters or were they corporate saboteurs? There are people with guns. Um, anyways, I'm getting off on that. Uh, you don't hear that in the mainstream. But Hillary Clinton was just on Murphy Brown recently, so we have that. The thing, anyways, I'm not even going to get with that. Shaz. You are exploring your life. This is a time for you to explore your life. And you will deal with others when it is time to deal with others. No reformist could rise to power by ignoring their employment or military tradition. No politician of peace has ever made any appeal to them. In the Iraq War, the justification which the administration manufactured and presented to Congress was not complicated, but clear and documented deception. The only meaningful resistance they ever encountered was outside of the cultural mainstream. In America, all the boasting and flag-waving, the proud-to-be-an-American stuff, is done by class unconscious majorities. The patriotism of the common people is militaristic but not economic. They do not retain among their historic, historical memories the names of a single labor victory. American economic history, like other countries, is full of class warfare, but it is worth noticing that the corporate model that has won for itself a kind of personhood is always an image of virtue and success. There is no popular cry for capital punishment for the most egregious of corporate citizens, revoking their corporate charters, for instance. Countrywide, countrywide Financial, I worked for them, remember? HFC. Facing a glut of toxic assets due to criminal lending practices, escapes death through a Bank of America takeover. I think those are the guys who foreclosed on my parents. They also um, launder money for nar narco traffic, but most banks do, so you can't hold it against them. The most stirring struggle against corporate abuse in the world is taking place in Ecuador, 
a struggle which Chevron inherited when it merged with Texaco. And Chevron itself, back when they were known as Standard Oil of California, and alongside fellow corporate criminals General Motors and Firestone, were convicted of criminal conspiracy for their part in the Great American Streetcar Scandal, the criminal dismantling of public transportation that precipitated American car culture is simply unknown to the general public. I forgot about that. So when people call you a conspiracy theorist, no, we, I, I like proven conspiracies. I'm not a theorist. The criminal dismantling of public transportation was a proven conspiracy. And these companies were convicted of it and they had to pay a fine. So we're not conspiracy theorists. Let's prove conspiracies in a court of law because that's a legal term. And that's social engineering. And now we're stuck with cars and traffic. You don't get mad at corporations. You get mad at the politicians. Those Democrats are those Republicans. It's the corporations that give us L.A. traffic. L.A. had the best streetcar system in the nation, I think, before they came in. So they not only fuck us with the wars, but they fuck us with our social engineering. When, and that's my sensitivity when I was in the military. It's like when I drive around in the inland empires, who made these fucking cities like this? The suburban sprawl, and then you have strip mall after strip mall. This is a profit motive of the way that we um, expand as a society. It's ugly, and it reeks to any sensitive mind, any person with a sense of aesthetics or a sense just noticing patterns. There are some ugly patterns at play here. The reason why the American pro-business rhetoric delights patriots is that it reinforces the mythology of the American dream. It looks like an unquestionable truth. After all, the 20th century has brought unprecedented technological and social advances and provided these by means of a modern economy. How dare did someone then turn around and say that business is wicked? It is quite true that the Americans are suspicious about the corporate class in the opinion that in the public, this suspicion takes the form of condemnation of the latest corporate criminal. But the condemnation of entire economic sectors would be a perfectly sound instinct. The finance, insurance, and real estate fire industries employ comparatively few people, yet their level of influence cannot help but strangle the productive economy. Central banks exist everywhere, but there is not such a thing as a public board. What American people what, what American people of nearly all classes loathe from the bottom of their hearts is a swindling financier type, the collusion of tycoons and the manipulation of markets. Decades before Hitler was ever heard of, the word robber baron had much the same significance in America as fascism has today. So deep does this feeling go that for a hundred years past, the industrial statesman, exemplified by really William Randall Hearst, then and Rupert so deep does this feeling go that for a hundred years past the industrial statesman, exemplified by William Randall Hearst, then, and Rupert Murdoch, now, have always taken their propaganda directly to the public. One rapid but fairly sure guide to the independence of a country is its control over its economy. A national economy is really a kind of dance, something like a collective performance, expressing a certain gracefulness in movement. The monetary system, for instance, is a kind of music, allowing for the coordinated interaction of goods and services on the dance floor. That's what I when people ask me, people get too much about money or the Fed or too much smaller issues, and I always try to generalize out to policy. I'm running for governor after all. So this is sounding like a platform because at that time, I guess I hadn't completely given up on that writing candidacy. I was like, I guess part of it, why I'm right, is like, all right, let's be about the war. I, I went back to my highest, biggest injustice of my life, that war. All of those emotions are driving me now that I've lost my girl and I'm back at home. And otherwise, I'd, I feel really dejected if I wasn't so passionate at this point. But I'm manic and passionate and writing this out. But I'm also laying out a platform. And so some of this is well articulated. And so I would say oh, when people get too much about the money supply, I'd say money is just an invention to facilitate the transfer of goods and services in the economy. We can have more efficient uses of money, and we can question fiat currency and whether that's good. And I think I watched a YouTube video about the fire economy, which kind of made sense to me. Oh, yeah, they, they have way too much control over our economy and, and what's going on. And, and some people might say, well, the whole world is moving away from manufacturing. And so there's arguments to be made, but honest intellectual arguments in which you show your side, I show my side, and we also show our work so other people can check our work. So 
but um, some of this is it's I it's interesting, and I agree with it. I agree with myself. Oh, really? You do shadows? That's interesting. It is simply an invention for economic interaction, contained in it quite consciously and intentionally, is a concept of a paper note in the place of something of value. Its artificiality is part of its essence, for what it is saying is, yes, I am worthless, and you dare to trust me, like the proprietor who lends credit against his frequent customer's word. Why have global monetary instruments been placed in private hands? They are, heaven knows, there are, heaven knows, plenty of democratic public tunes by which the national economies can dance, including America's constitutional mandate for Congress to control the monetary jukebox. So Congress is supposed to be in charge of the monetary supply, but we've given that to the Federal Reserve because supposedly they're supposed to do a better job as a private institution. And, and so you just have to look at the logic of the system. Like, do we really believe in democracy? Do we really believe in civilian oversight of the military? Or do commanders in these comm centers uh, have, operate like Roman consuls, proconsuls, and have more authority than the diplomats who are supposed to have jurisdic jur jurisdiction over the same area? Just a real clear question. Who is more powerful in international affairs, the United States State Department or the United States military? One has the bombs, and, and one, so, and then who makes more money? Well, no, that would be arguable. When they leave office, the military officers or the State Department, they both cash in on their service, right? Um, but so now this is asking now, the Federal Reserve or Congress? Which one did the Constitution say should control interstate commerce? And I, I don't know, I'd have to look at the Constitution, but... Constitution, I would assume, from what I'm saying here, mandates that Congress is supposed to control the money supply, but we just now they just have oversight over the Federal Reserve, who's a private institution who controls it, just like they're supposed to have oversight over the CIA, but they consistently do things like spying on domestic citizens, uh, spying domestically and doing other stuff. Anyway, so again, off track. It is not enforced because the ten technocrats in the positions of power would laugh. Beyond a certain point, economic democracy is only possible in countries where the common people dare to refuse the sheet music of the private global finance syndicate. The Vietnamese attempted economic sovereignty at about the time when Southeast Asia passed definitely under American control, and as was clearly articulated, so did much of the rest of the world. The Latin American governments, if they rebelled, were bound to incur stiff discipline for dancing to their own tunes. I like this metaphor, it's working. In the globalist choir, the cadence is rigged, rigid and uncompromising, full of invocations of theory and counter theory, but without democratic participation, the dance is merely a formalized cakewalk. It is a game which is won by the conductor who, controlling the music, knows where to position himself when the movement stops. And yet the manipulation of American and world economies is obscured by xenophobia and nationalism. International solidarity is as out of date as the ideologies of the third world holdouts. Over against the storming American Marine, you have got to set that typically private figure, the financial ideologue, some gouty old bully with his mind rooted in corporate profits, benefiting from the savagery of war. In America, military and public servants pound the drumbeat of empire while benefiting from or even being directly employed by international corporations. These war profiteers are obscene as well as amoral, but there has never been any genuinely popular outcry against them. People accept them and the technocrats and the jingoists, so that's a pretty good division, war profiteers, technocrats, jingoists, almost as they accept the mythic benevolence of the founding fathers, or the federalness of the Federal Reserve. They are part of the war effort, which is assumed to be for the common good. Here one comes upon an all-important American belief, the respect for self-enrichment and ownership, the belief in profit as something sacred above society and beyond reproach, something which should be reaped responsibly and humbly, of course, but at any rate, a natural right. It is not that anyone imagines the society to be just, 
Everyone knows that there is one America for the rich and another for the poor. But no one accepts the implications of this. Everyone accepts that the foreign policy interests of the elite and subsequent wars are Everyone accepts that the foreign policy interests of the elite and subsequent wars are their interests and do not have the faculties to identify where they are not. Huh. So I'm trying to peel off, show that America's foreign policy and American interest is corporate interest. It's not the average person's interest. We actually, that's how you, you socialize terrorism. I mean, you socialize the costs and privatize the benefits. The cost of wars of aggression is increased terrorism abroad and domestically. And then the profits are corporate profits. So the corporations reap the profits, and they also have the higher security guards to keep themselves and their families safe. And then those of us, who, are, who do terrorists target? The civilians. We're paying for the corporate profits in our own blood. Abroad when the soldiers die, and at home when the chickens come home to roost. That's a very simple argument to make. Remarks like spreading democracy, promoting peace, or fighting for freedom, liberating the oppressed, are part of the propaganda of American corporate America aggression. The professed enemies of America share this confusion as strongly as anyone else. One sees it in the anti-Americanism of Osama bin Laden or Mahmoud Ahmadinejad in the solemn idiocies that escape the lips, lips of American critics, in letters to the papers from eminent humanitarian organizations pointing out that this or that is a crime against humanity. Samantha Powers is the most famous victim whore where she goes and finds a victim who is beneficial to American interests like the um, Benghazi, whoever, whatever there's talking about Benghazi, the reason why we went into Libya was that there was a, a group that we had to protect. And then people have called her out on it and openly said, you know, you're very silent on the people who are in American interest to ignore. And you seem to be very vocal on the people. I read her books, but we're going to talk about her when we have time to talk about her. Everyone believes in his heart that the American government can be, ought to be, and on the whole, will be democratically administered. The totalitarian idea he, the totalitarian idea that here is no such thing as democracy, there is only power, has not taken root. Even the intelligentsia have only accepted it in theory. An empire is never democratic. War is always directed first and foremost against domestic threats to state power. I got that from reading Randolph Byrne, which was an anarchist when I was doing that San Francisco, car, swimming in the ocean, showering, decompression from the California citizens audit. I started reading a little anarchy theory, and I started being like, all right, these guys might be consistently right about history. If not a pl applicable political theory, which it seems like it'd be hard to apply a lot of those ideas into real life until we get to that point technology-wise, it doesn't, if you read history, they seem to be on the right side of history a lot of times. I was starting to realize a lot of the ideas hard won that I've earned and gotten to this point were coinciding with some old school anarchists there. And I was like, all right, all right. It's not, but that's me buying into it because of the reading of history and not because I wanted to wear a checkered red and black flag or something like that. But I know those guys too, and they're nice, but an anarchist hit me in the head with a metal baseball bat, so... I know that your identity, political identity, that you use just to justify who you are and to justify violence against other people who you feel are not like you is one thing. And then, and then actually reading history and having a, a belief system grounded in objective reality is another. So that kid who, who attacked me with a baseball bat isn't grounded in objective reality. He's a seen kid, and he uses his political beliefs to get laid and to have a little power power group in um, Brooklyn. I've talked to him since though, and we made our peace. His, his punishment is having to be himself, and that's punishment enough. The familiar arguments to the effect that we live in a post 9-11 world or face new enemies never take account of this fact. All such arguments boil down to saying that the enemy of American empire is without and not within. In the American conscious, some concepts as justice, liberty, and objective truth are still believed in. They may be illusions, but they are very powerful illusions. The belief in them influences conduct. Patriotism is born of them, in proof of which look about you. 
What is posse comitatus? Why is it being subverted? The sword is still in the scabbard, but it is being ready to be wielded against the homeland. The International Financial Syndicate, for instance, is supranational. In a dozen obvious ways, the American military acts in the interest of the global moneyed class. But until some deep change has occurred in the patriotic mind, America cannot be internally reformed. You do not arrive at the polling booth to find politicians free of corporate influence telling you which way to dismantle empire, nor are the reformers organized, nor are there any meaningful alternatives. So, so what do we need? We need politicians who are free of corporate influence telling you how to peacefully dismantle the American empire. Obviously, that's what we need. And also, that's another really good way to attack our empire. These are really good phrasings, is that the military is used in the interest of the supranational international financial syndicate. When you show that our military is just being used as patsies for the global banking, banking elite, then maybe we'll start peeling the military off of the side of empire and, and towards what whether you love him or hate him, Washington warned us of foreign wars of entanglement because they saw how that brought down other kings of their time. That's exactly what indebted France and led to the uh, French Revolution. So America saw the writing on the wall that um, your independence and sovereignty can be taken away from you through uh, foreign entanglements. And what do we have now? Perpetual war. And what does the intelligentsia tell us? These wars are forever and we just have to get used to it while our public treasury is being raided. This pattern is very simple. We are France at the turn of the Revolutionary War, or the French Revolution. We are an indebted nation with perpetual war, with buffoonish leaders who don't have the power or the objective verified reality framework to actually see what's going on around them. And then what, you were going to rally people around Washington and cut off their heads? That didn't do France anything. It's just going to set up the next dictator strongman. Is that what America is being set up for? To have a cathartic revolution so a strongman can come in and just get rid of all of our democratic principles? So this is really interesting because this line that I have right here is pointing out that we still have those principles. We're just not enacting them. But the myth is still very strong and it can be awoken in us. That's an interesting take on it. This is maybe this is the basis of my platform for actually running for president because I got this out of trying to run for governor of California. This is the um, synthesis of that wisdom. So this is the fruit of that experience. So this maybe is the seed of this new adventure after which maybe I'll even have a bigger fruit. But hopefully instead I have results is the idea. But this is something to be used now. Patriotism is a powerful motivation. The myth of the founding father, that benevolent old man of noble ideals and self-made wealth, whom nothing short of treason could ever impeach, but who will, at any rate, be used to justify the bastardization of his experiment, is one of the contradictory figures of American mythology. I'm finding really good wedge issues here, ways that you can phrase things to force people to think critically. He is, a, or at least motivate people to think critically. He is a symbol of the strange mixture of enlightenment and self-enrichment, democracy and authoritarianism, cooperation and coercion, the subtle perversion of ideals by which a bureaucratic state justifies his existence. I have spoken all the while of the nation, America, United States, as though 50 states could somehow be treated as a unit. But is not America notoriously two nations, the red state and the blue? Dare one pretend that there is anything in common between people in urban centers and people in the sprawling suburban and rural outlands? And even Republican and Democrat readers are likely to have been defended because I've used the word class oftener than opportunity, as though the whole population was a lottery ticket or reality showcase away from financial security. One gets a better view of this question if one considers the conservative point first. So I was going to go through both sides, I think, Republican and Democrat. Yeah, this is good. This probably this project's like a month away from completion. I, I'm pretty sure I got at least halfway through the book, and I, I did this in like a week. So yeah, I would just I would want to make sure I stayed true to the spirit because it seems like whatever truth I had here was pretty pure. It was pretty on point. I wouldn't disagree with a lot of this stuff. 
And I've lived a lot more since then. I went through Occupy Wall Street. This is before Occupy Wall Street, all this stuff. I read a lot more theory. I still really like a lot of this. So this is a sellable product, I think. It is quite true that the so-called political persuasions of America feel themselves to be very independent from one another. A libertarian, for instance, does not think you have call him a Republican. You can see the hesitation we feel on this point by the fact that we measure our ideologies by at least six different categories, far left, left, centrist, the right, far right, and in a very exasperated moment, the apathetic. Even the differences between left and far left loom large in our own eyes. But somehow these differences fade away the moment that any two Americans are confronted by war. It is very rare to meet a pacifist, other than a symbolic one, who can find a home among the left or the right, or even the far left or the far right. To a patriot, peace and pacifism seem very different beings, and the justice of military power is an accepted fact in the United States, at the very least regarding the consecrated triumvirate of holy wars, which consist of the revolutionary, the civil, and the second world war. Yet we speak of hawks and doves recognizing divisions of strategy amid a singular acceptance for war lust, which in fact it is. So also with ourselves, looked at from the outsider, even the humanitarian and the service member have a strong connection. And even the distinction between political and apolitical dwindles somewhat when one regards the war from the cultural mainstream. There is no question about the injustice of the war in Iraq. It is grosser than any modern colonial effort, and you have only to look down the cement barricaded streets of Baghdad or up to the Vatican-sized and similarly reinforced green zone to see it. Economically, Iraq is certainly colonized, if not partitioned, as once was opium-lulled China. But at the same time, the vast majority of the Iraqi people feel themselves to be a single nation and are conscious of resisting foreigners more than they resist one another. Pan-Arabism is stronger than sectarian violence, and always stronger than any kind of foreign occupation, except for a brief moment in the 1960s. And then this is a note, I didn't, because we're starting to get to the part where like, I didn't read through this, and a lot of this wasn't rewritten yet. When you write, and then you read through, and you change it, and you read through, and change At least that's how I write. And every time I go back to a draft, I change a little bit of things. So the stuff at the top is more done than the stuff at the bottom. And once you do so many readings and writings, and then once you're done with the whole piece, then I do a couple final reviews, and then I finally get that stuff at the very end. So I can tell I'm getting near the end because there's some notes that I haven't corrected or filled out yet. The earlier stuff from here, everything above it, I think, was pretty polished, probably. I'd probably as done as it was going to be, except for a brief moment in the 1960s, cut short by the CAA. Oh, never mind. I was wrong. This is just a normal aside. But I still, th that is a pattern that I've noticed, and later on. But um, but no, this is done too. I thought that was um, a direction. I saw the word cut short, and I thought I was telling myself to do something. Shaz, don't jump to conclusions when interpreting your own writing, because you do a disservice to yourself. And by yourself, I mean you, and by you, I mean me. Cut short by the CIA-sponsored coup led by Saddam Hussein. The Iraqi people have never been allowed autonomous democratic development. For 12 years, they watched their weak and poor countrymen slowly strangled by inhuman sanctions and never received the benefit of even updated university textbooks. But when our own nation, the country of WW2 heroics and Wilsonian idealism, decided to finally invade them, this reality was very differentially depicted. At the moment when it seemed likely that America might invade, Dick Cheney offered his belief that we will, in fact, be greeted as liberators. Meanwhile, his old company, Halliburton, secured $7 billion in no-bid contracts in the run-up to the war alone, and another $20 billion have gone to foreign companies whose so identities have been impossible to determine. After finally collecting over $25 billion in U.S. government contracts, Halliburton decided in itself in 2007 to move its headquarters to Dubai, showing how little national loyalties used to sell lucrative wars really mean to the corporate winners of these free market cakewalks. One has only to compare, you know what, when I was in third grade, I won a cakewalk. We had a fair at my school, and um, I remember this, because when I think about why I'm so cool, you have to think about all these little moments when you're young, you're like, man, that was pretty cool. And um, 
I uh, had a friend in third grade, and we'd have handshakes, and we'd do like, and for, so I was still like, even back then trying to impress girls. I broke my collarbone. Did I mention that earlier? We, um, in second grade, I guess, yeah, second grade probably, maybe first grade, first or second grade, this girl gives me a note. I'm new in class, moving schools constantly, but then finally at like fifth grade, we stayed in one place, and those friends I kept throughout high school pretty much. But first, second, third grade, always different. My parents bouncing around, not much support from their family, um, young family on their own, doing their own thing, that we learned later how, how much they were doing their own thing. I'm in class, and um, this girl gives me a note, do you like me, check yes or no? And I look at her, strong conservative Christian upbringing, like, I had girls I liked, she wasn't one of them, she was more, she was like, I could tell the, the innocent, and she wasn't innocent, she was like, how are you trying to get boyfriends? I was like, Psh, just ignored it. But I, I smiled at her, I was like, Psh, that's not my thing, I'm not having sex till I'm married. Um, not even that we were thinking about sex, well, within a couple of years, third, fourth graders, we're starting to talk dirty, talking about boners, fourth, fifth grade, we're just, I think around like fourth or fifth grade, you get your first boner, and you're like, oh, what's this? And then people talking about jacking off, and I think seventh grade, when you first jack off, but some people like fifth and sixth grade, they're fucking, and then sleepovers where you share all that male wisdom, male to male, oh my gosh, what happened? blah, 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 and like some dudes show each other their dicks, we didn't do that, but you heard about that dude who showed everyone his dick, it's like, all right, dude, that's cool and all, but, and then fucking someone's claiming that they're, they're having sex, fifth grade, oh my gosh, are you, no, you're not, but no one could prove anything, and then by middle school, a couple more people are, who knows, maybe now, it's like you Google anything, and you fucking, you, you've, Kids are having less sex, but they're seeing more sex online. You can see anything. But, um, but so that girl, do you like me check yes or no, no? Or I didn't, I, I was subtle about it. But then her and her friends, and then me and my friends, I had like two friends, and we would run around, like other kids would play, but we'd try to like run by them and like tag them or run. And then I think one of the girls I liked, Kylene Christofferson or some shit, some blonde girl. And, um, I was trying to be cool and I was like running and falling and then get up and run past them again and fall. And I tripped and I tripped in a hole, the hole that I kept pretending to trip in just so they would look over. And then I broke my collarbone. I fell and, and that was the begin yeah, yeah, that was the beginning of me making an ass out of myself for female attention. Um, but not the end. Um, so yeah. So but like I knew I could get it if I was a big enough I guess so that was me like, you know, reinforcing, you know I said. That was me reinforcing that part of myself. Hey, look at me. It's Shaz, and he's doing stuff. And so cakewalk. I keep seeing this cakewalk, and I'm like, I have this metaphor that I use twice now or something. But in third grade, we have a fair, and I'm there on my own. I don't know why I'm not with my folks or anyone else. I'm just, uh, we live right down the street, so I probably walked to the school on my own. Little hoodlum kids. That was one of those neighborhoods we lived in where if you go too far, we know gangs are over there. So like, once we loaned one of those kids a video game, we never saw the video game back. We didn't go chase it. We're like, yeah, that's why we don't play with those kids because those kids are wrong. But um, but everything this side of us was cool. And we're like in that, those middle, I guess I'm used to those middle estuaries. A little bit of violence, a little bit of normal normalcy. So I, I, I walked from home to school was pretty safe. We would walk every day. So I must have done that. But I was at school alone and we're having this fair. And what is a cakewalk? I don't know, but I go in, they give me a number. I think I had a couple bucks on me. And then I, I stop on a number and I get a cake and they gave me a whole cake. And as a hungry little Mexican kid from a poor family, I ate that whole cake. Just like, I just felt like a king. I was walking around that fair just eating that cake. And I was just like, I never, I never, I don't get candy, let alone a cake to myself. So I was just like fisting it, just like walking around like a king. Like, like, so a cake, winning a cakewalk to me is a third grade memory of me winning a cakewalk. And me being like, I'm a boss. Like, just where'd you get that cake? You want some, dude? That's my cake. Is it, oh, that's a whole cake? That's, yeah, dude, I could do whatever I want with it. I earned it. I want it. And um, this other home gardens in Corona, it was at school, home gardens elementary. And we would call it home garbage. Because when you're a kid, you, you, uh, you know that you're poor living among poor people going to a poor ass school. So it's home garbage. Kids are very self aware. They find any insecurity and they just, that's why you got to be self aware too. Don't be mean. Be the adult. Don't try to destroy a kid. But you ain't got to take shit from them. They're, they're a kid. But, um, yeah, what else? We had these secret handshakes that we would do in front of the girls, and they think we're cool. And then I had that time I tried to impress them. I hurt myself. All of that. I went to there for a couple years. So I had two, three years there, actually. I think first grade to third grade, and then we moved. But um, there's this kid. We were playing tag. We were playing some game, and I was chasing after him. He's going down the hallway, and I had a trapper keeper, a little trapper. And I throw it down the hallway. 
and it slides right under his foot and he's running and he slips on it and he falls and I just start busting up and he tried to cry or something. I was like, ah, I was like, dude, come on. That was cool. He can't get mad. So that was another little like cool thing. But um, to balance it out, um, all of my life wasn't cool or me doing cool shit. When I got that collarbone that I, I broke at school, I felt pretty dumb. That was silly. Um, that girl I didn't date in first grade, I would have been less sheltered if I'd gone down that path and paid more attention to female energy instead of being more. But that was my religious thing. I had to get over that and start creating my own opinions. Um, so none of my crush crushes I consummated all the way up to that girl in high school. All my crushes in school, I kind of just like watched from afar. And then um, I pooped my pants in um, preschool and had to be taken home. And that was pretty embarrassing. So there's... There's cool stuff and there's embarrassing stuff in school, like always. It was never like, I'm always on top. It was like, um, but but I, I anyways, kickwalks. I just remember that I was thinking like, I was that. It's weird those little memories from your childhood. As I was a king that day with that kick. Just well, the insecurities is being poor, and going to home garbage elementary. But that day, no one could tell me shit. Cause wait till I get my um, sugar right. Or whatever I don't know. A kid—that's all a kid needs. It don't need much. A cake makes a kid a king, right? One has only to come, and that's the wisdom of the child that we try to go back to—the simplicity that you don't need much to be happy. One has only to compare this supranational war profiteering bonanza with, for instance, the patriotic drivel choking the mainstream to see how vast the strength of war propaganda compared with objective reality. Tim Duncan has nothing to say regarding war profiteers, but NBA fans can rest assured that he supports the troops, a basket full of domestic and international crimes against often the letter of the law as well as the spirit, not to mention humanity and public trust, all legitimized with a stilted public service announcement spliced with images of men in uniform. That will bug me. I'm watching basketball and I'm like, Tim Duncan stands up, I support the troops, blah, blah, blah. It's like, the fuck does that do anything for world justice? Or that's that pisses me off. Blind patriotism, flag fuckers, is is a pet peeve of mine. So what the, you want to support the troops? Support investigating a war of aggression and this ongoing genocide. You know you, you can't just profit from patriotism without actually supporting our country by supporting the values upon which we are supposed to be founded. That's otherwise you're just you're 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 flag washing your corporation to make more money. That's obvious, and I don't have anything. Tim Duncan, he's a boring dude, but like other than that, I don't have anything against him. There's some cute images of him and his daughter in the media recently, but nah, if you're gonna, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't just blindly be patriotic to make money, and that's why I condemn those who do. You hear that? It's fucking craziness. It would almost be as blasphemous to support the truth as to disparage our armed forces if the truth contradicted the narratives of the patriotic hordes. Forgotten in all of this public relations goose-stepping, it is the sworn duty of our service members to protect the country from all enemies, domestic as well as foreign. But then, to charge the financiers of war would be to knock the aristocrat down from his horse, which is to say it would be bad form. To some the saddle, others the mallet, and the rest to be caromed about like a ball in play. There's some good shit in here. In America, subservient patriotism takes different forms and different ideologies, but it runs like a connecting thread through nearly all of them. Only the culturally ignorant are really immune to it. As a reactionary em emotion it is stronger in the heartland than on the liberal coast, the rural poor, for instance, are more dependent on military employment than their urban counterparts. But the number of consciously self-serving patriots, the Cheney type, is probably very small. In the red states, patriotism is profound, but it is sincere. The good old boy's mind does not leap to aggression when he sees the stars and stripes, but rather pride. But the famous jingoism and xenophobia of the right is far stronger in the cultural leader than in the common Republican. In all countries, the rich are more class conscious than the poor, but the American elite class are outstanding in the unity of message and control over its dissemination, even when they are obliged to at least nominally abide by non-monopolistic -monop practices. Media figures collude either to mirror elite objectives or to give complementary narratives. 
Nearly every American of conservative identification considers it effeminate to withdraw from military conflict without declaring declaration of victory. Reflecting on the annihilation of Vietnam, the largest regret voiced is not the loss of life, but the loss of American prestige. The sole lament that we were not able to finish the job, as if the survival of a sovereign nation through a firestone, firestorm of historically unprecedented foreign aggression was something to mourn. In eight years on Iraq soil, these apologists have not even acquired the faintest of appreciation for the burgeoning humanitarian crisis, the largest refugee disaster in the Middle East since the displacement of the people of Palestine. The insularity of the rabid patriot, the refusal to take humanity seriously, is a trait that allows them to be paid very heavily in times of war. Glenn Burke did not rally to oppose the war, but to sell it to the masses. Rush Limburg did not earn $400 million to play the gentle lamb. Peace has never been that profitable. They play their part in the American propaganda mills, and the sincere who have tried to break their shtick down have generally done much more harm to themselves than their subject. At bottom, it is the same filth in the pigsty that repels the truth and keeps out the self-respecting. Here, one comes back to two American characteristics that I pointed out seemingly at random, at the beginning of the last chapter. One is the plasticity of character. This is perhaps another way of saying that Americans are without a native culture. For there are many heritages from which they have gleaned plenty of traditions, namely English, but this is also the heritage of kings and prophetized war. Great Britain, especially the royal family, and the young princes most of all, are a kind of political celebrity with little or no real power outside their own popularity. Except for Tony Blair, the most powerful English politicians are barely known in America, even as names. The only people who are widely acknowledged are Prince Harry, who lent his celebrity to the Afghan war cause, and Prince William, who is currently in the Royal Air Force. And linked up with this, though not very obviously, is the need for our own political royalty. The presence in nearly all Americans of any political stripe for an avatar of patriotism to embody the national mythology. And so we politicize our celebrities by celebrating their patriotism. In such a way, our passivity is revealed through our longing for these heroic stand-ins, a virtual reality, parallel world, staged moral morality plays, entertainment to make up for our increasing lack of personal empowerment. We are unified in our shared disengagement from reality, to the point that our social skills and subqu subsequently our society is disintegrating. So I was, I was on to some shit 10 years ago, eight years ago. But this is, I'm right back here. I'm right back. This is stuff that I just came back to this year. The more we seek and steam from virtual sources, the more we allow not just our time and resources, but our very minds to be colonized until resistance cannot even be imagined, let alone acted upon. It's the war for your mind. What more can be said of the priesthood of war than a mental gelding of empathic human animal? Is not a child born with a loving and playful nature? Perhaps our pastimes are not warlike as much as our wars game-like. In a majority of the stories we entertain ourselves with people who... In a majority of the stories we entertain ourselves with, people don't die morbid deaths of blood and gore, losing control of their bladders and crying for their mothers, Rather, they die push-button deaths, as if simple robots powering down. One accurate and often bloodless knife-bullet explosion, and the participant has to sit out for the round. Stories of Indian warfare readily allude to gaming traditions, giving marks to the combatant who, combatant who can touch the enemy and return to his camp safely. Imagine this dangerous form of tag spontaneously breaking out over a trench line. Yet, as veterans can attest, Stranger things have occurred when human nature happens to escape the narrow ideological blinders of conflict. Flash truces, displays of compassion, completely irrational acts from a battlefield perspective stand out as outliers from what the warmongers would have us believe is our naturally aggressive nature. And so by manipulating how a population views itself, manufacturers of these narratives can manipulate what a population perceives as possible, which is how warfare with all its blatant entropy creation, is transformed, at the very least, 
tacitly into a necessary step towards an ordered civilization, while pacifism, a regressive naivety. Thus, the good patriot's defense that real peace is desirable but not possible, and war an undesirable but necessary fact of life. Only the dead have seen the end of war? No. Only the dead have achieved the highest glory through war, for war is a form of national necrophilia. In the same way that romantic love is consummated through sex, warfare is consummated through death, wearing its battlefield pall like lingerie for the, porn pornograph for, the porno for the pornographers of violence. In this way, the war machine feeds upon the seduction of youth achieved through a culture of mindless patriotism. That's some good shit. Up to a point, a sense of national unity is a substitute for common sense. Just because patriotism is all but universal, and not even the apolitical are uninfluenced by it, there can be moments when the whole nation suddenly swings together and does the same thing like a herd of cattle corralled by sheepdog. There was such a moment, unmistakably, at the time of the disaster in New York. Before an awestruck citizenry could even vaguely wonder what the attack was about, the people were suddenly told what they had to do. First, to start bombing Af Afghanistan, and secondly, to invade Iraq. It was like the manipulation of a trauma victim. Quick, danger, the Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And then the swift, unanimous action. And then, alas, the prompt sharing of our Samson's wealth and shackling to the temple of permanent militarization. In a traumatized nation, that would have been exactly the moment for a big reformation movement to arise. I was predicting Occupy Wall Street right here. A year before it happened, or two years. But does this mean that the rational instinct of the American will will always be subverted by the march towards war? Not at all. Merely the fact that a 9-11 truth movement exists reflects the stubbornness of independent thought in America around the world. And around the world. In the 1942 attack on our Hawaiian colony, Pearl Harbor, for instance, we were led into a world war in perfect lockstep. We were as single-minded as the Gadarene swine. I think that's his term. I just borrowed it. I'm borrowing most of his structure. But I honestly doubt whether anyone can now say that the attack was not allowed, even invited, for this purpose. Truth has an unfortunate habit of enduring the marathon of time. It follows that American democracy is even more of a fraud than it sometimes appears. A casual observer sees only the huge inequality of wealth, the monetized electoral system, the consolidated control over the press, the radio and television, with the internet still being fought for, and concludes that democracy is simply a polite name for corporatism. But this ignores the considerable power that is unfortunately still being shifted to the leaders from the lead. However much one may hate to admit it, it, almost cer it is almost certain that since the passage of the Patriot Act, remember that, the national government has appropriated, at least legislative terms, the liberty of the mass of the people. It sanctioned torture, surveillance, and unchecked domestic suppression. Yes, but it did pass through Congress. It was a patriotic period, and our elected officials were mediocrities. This legislation gave teeth to what a cynic would then call a corporate state, and what a realist must now acknowledge is a benevolent form of fascism. Eight years ago, I was at this point. I don't think anything's changed. It's only gotten worse in those eight years. The government does not strong-arm corporate citizens to violate the civil liberties of Americans. There is no government. Corporations manufacture legislation. This is, this is from being in the halls of government. I was this clear thinking. Before I had my opinion, but seeing it firsthand and talking to guys thinking they were actually telling me the truth and inspiring me. I was, this is now my verdict. Corporations manufacture legislation, which allows them to retain the in and increase their stranglehold on any meaningful political social power. The amount of actual policy work that corporate lobbyists perform, as opposed to elected officials, is transparently one-sided. Dur during a personal tour of, in 2010 of the California State Capitol building, I was informed by a newly minted and therefore perhaps uncommonly candid aide, the Rhodes Scholar, that lobbyists do much of the le heavy lifting around here. We couldn't function without them. It is not a stretch of the imagination to assume that what, by the casual citizen observer, could be construed as a gross violation of democratic principle, is accepted as necessary fact of governance by all but a small minority of elected officials, 
and their staff across a whole castrated political spectrum. The business of running the United States has been delegated as a function of the largest companies in each sector. And with the election of Obama at the federal level, we've now peacefully transferred ruling power from a dominance of energy brokers to a cabal advocating the interests of the financial services sector. And that's the historic record. He got the most money out of them out of any elected official. In spite of the campaigns of the independent left and the right, it is fairly certain that the bulk of the Congress were behind Bush's foreign policy. More, it is fairly certain that the same struggle going on in Bush's mind were dissimilar to the minds of ordinary citizens. His opponents professed to see him in a buffoonish and ignorant clown, to see him as a buffoonish and ignorant clown, swaggering into the war shoes of his father. But it is far likelier that he was merely a homespun broker selling the interests of his class, utilizing his admittedly very meager skill set. It is difficult otherwise to explain the unity of his policy, his ability to immediately grasp the path towards war that opened to him. As a one-time insurance salesman, I like to think that I can recognize when someone's selling me a policy, especially one that they might not completely understand themselves. Unlike a rational citizen, he did not want to discuss the merits of either peace or of war, and the public opinion was behind him all the while, taking in a sales pitch that was completely manufactured years prior by the architects of empire. It was behind him when he went to Afghanistan, when he gave ultimatums regarding weapons of mass destruction, when he invaded Iraq, when he secured its oil fields, and when he finally executed Saddam by proxy. Only in 2006, when the results of his policy became apparent, did public opinion turn against him, which is to say that it turned against its own passive policy, consumption lethargy of the pa of its own passive policy consumption lethargy of the past three years. Thereupon, the people elected en masse the ostensible anti-war party, the Democrats, who were at any rate able to defend themselves by disowning the errors, if not the war itself. To use perhaps obscure life insurance analogy, if Bush's slogan was buy term and invest the difference, the Democrats merely suggested that American people look into whole life. They did not stop the cycle, they merely substituted the policies being sold, while keeping their war quotas the same. Someday, perhaps, citizens will grasp that democracy is not the brokering of elite interests, but an open forum of national discourse, and the merits of peace should not be sold, but merely recognized. The merits of peace should not have to be sold, but don't merely recognized. Do I mean all this? But do I mean by all this that all of Congress is a warmongering body? No, but not even an independent-minded Dennis Kucinich or Ron Paul could nudge the warship from its intended course. I. How much more do we have? Well, we have enough to do another video. So we will be a little meta here, nudged by the term and intended course. Yeah, so we have a minute before this video ends. This is why I keep them open-ended because I don't know how long these are gonna take. And this one apparently I thought was gonna be a half hour and that's why I ranted for the first 40 minutes and now we're on part three and we're gonna have a part four. But if it was, well, it doesn't matter. Even if I didn't like the writing, I'd still read it all because I said I was going to read and review everything that I've done up to this point in life. And so that's what I'm doing. It's a marathon, not a sprint. So no excuses. You have coffee shafts, but sometimes coffee makes you tired, especially if, if you if you work out. I need water, not coffee. I'm going to take a break, stop this, get a big cup of water. Um, yeah. And then I think I have another half hour, hopefully, hopefully 15 minutes. Um, but let it there's there's a um it is what it is it's a process i have the whole month of december i was hoping to finish this by the 15th of december more of these multi-part videos will push it towards the end but it's okay i believe in you shaz and that's the most important thing i believe in you and i love you and you never forget that you've begun talking to yourself which i don't know is a sign of good mental health or bad but either way now you have another friend in me so I am on a journey. I definitely am on a journey. Do I see the light at the end of the tunnel? I, I see something. I see the end of the tunnel getting longer and farther away. But, eh, 
I, my butt is just going numb. Okay, new video, ready to go.